Romans chapter 6. Hear now the word of the Lord as he speaks through the Apostle Paul. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. And we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members, that is your body parts, to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as Obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, who were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is God's holy and inspired word. Thanks be to him. The doctrine of sanctification. John Murray said that the aim of sanctification is the elimination of all sin and complete confirmation to the image of God's own Son to be holy as the Lord is holy. Eliminating all sin, being conformed to the image of the Son of God and being holy as God himself is holy. Sanctification. Alexander Archibald Hodge said that sanctification involves the gradual destruction of the old body of sin and the quickening and strengthening of all the graces of the new man and inward purification of the heart, mind, and actions. Dying to sin and being made alive in Christ and all of his benefits. Sanctification. Abraham Kuyper, 
called sanctification, one of the greatest gifts bestowed upon believers within the covenant of grace. Sanctification. Caspar Olivianus called justification and sanctification the double benefit of redemption in Christ Jesus. The double benefit. Sanctification. Tonight, what we're going to look at as we dig into this topic of sanctification is where is it in the order of salvation? What is it? And is it a biblical doctrine? So this is what we've done every week. Nothing tricky here. Where is sanctification in the order of salvation? What is sanctification? Definition of our terms. And is it a biblical doctrine? You never know, right? Never trust these Presbyterians. So that's why we're here this evening, to find out about the doctrine of sanctification in the order of salvation, a definition, and whether or not it is biblical. So let's begin with where it is in the order of salvation. Remember, in this current sermon series, we are discovering how the Reformed tradition looks at the application of redemption. And that is with a particular logical order, also known as the order of salvation. And I'm going to throw a new term out there. If you ever hear this one, now you know what it means. The ordo salutis. The ordo salutis. Have you heard that term before? The ordo salutis. My wife's like, yes, I've heard the term. So the application of redemption, the What we're talking about is the order of salvation. Just throw out another term, ordo salutis. It's a good one. So just think of the chalkboard right over there. Chalkboard, right? Redemption by the Holy Trinity has two essential parts. You've got redemption accomplished on one side, and you've got redemption applied on the other side. Redemption accomplished concerns the work of redemption carried out by the Son of God according to to the will of God the Father. On behalf of the elect, according to that covenant made in the councils of eternity, you remember that one? Covenant of redemption, or the pactum salutis. On behalf of the elect, the Son of God agrees to come in the flesh, live a life of perfect obedience under the law, in order to redeem his people by making atonement for their sin, being raised from the dead, ascending into heaven, sitting on the throne, where he now reigns and rules over all things, including his church, especially his church, from where he pulls or pours out his Holy Spirit, makes intercession for his people, and will return to judge the living and the dead. That is redemption accomplished by the Son of God, according to the will of God, And that is why Jesus says in John chapter 17, verse 1, in his high priestly prayer, as he prays to the Father, he says, Father, the hour has come to glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Who has the Father given him? Yeah, the elect. That's whom the Father has given him, his holy people. Jesus continues, This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Remember, God the Father sends the Son. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. That's awesome. Our Lord Jesus is talking about the Pactum Salutis, which only he, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit were privy to. The covenant of redemption, that eternal covenant by which God the Father chooses a people in the Son, and the Son willingly agrees to come down and accomplish that redemption through his perfect work, and then in time... The Spirit applies the work of Christ to his people, the elect. 
So that brings us to redemption applied. Redemption is accomplished. Redemption is earned by the work of Christ. And it is applied to his people through handbells and chimes. No? Redemption is earned by Christ and applied to his people through pretty colors and banners. Nope. Through the organ or piano. Nope. Through candles and chandeliers. Still no. You got me. Just seeing if you're paying attention. Redemption earned by Christ is applied to his people by the power of the Holy Spirit working through the word, applying his work to us. Think about that now. We have his life, his righteousness, his death, his blood, his resurrection, that is his life applied to us, given to us. And we're united to the one who now sits in the high heavenly places. That's amazing. Because of the work of the Holy Spirit. That's redemption applied. That's what this sermon series has been about. We're looking at the way the Reformed tradition talks about the order of salvation, redemption applied. Because remember, there is a logical order to the application of redemption. That's why we call it the order of salvation. So here it is. The Spirit works through the preaching of the gospel, effectually calls, so that there's an outward call, and then there's an inward call, the effectual call, and by which he draws people into Christ, union with Christ, and in being drawn into the one who lives forever, we are then given new life in Jesus Christ. What's that called? Regeneration. We have new hearts and new minds. And once we're regenerated, we are new creatures in Christ, right? Behold, uh, the old has passed away, the new has come. If you're in Christ Jesus, you are a new creation. And we are enabled to believe for the saving of our souls, to turn from our sin, to turn to Christ. What's that called? Faith and repentance. Repenting of their sin, the elect are then justified. Justified means we can now stand before God because he has applied the righteousness of Christ to us. It's been imputed to us, and we are now righteous before him. He accepts us. And being justified, there's another legal act that takes place. What's that? Heard about it last week? Adoption. Remember, our adoption papers are written in the councils of eternity, and they are written in the blood of Jesus. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? And we receive the Spirit of adoption that we can cry out, Abba, Father. And so, as his children, what next? What's that next logical step in the order of salvation? Sanctification. God's holy people are made more and more holy throughout their lives, and this is called sanctification. It's a process of dying to sin and being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ in true righteousness and holiness. That's the point of being chosen in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. We were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him. To be his holy people. It means we're set apart. That's what it means. That's what being made holy means. We've been set apart by the blood of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. We've been consecrated, made holy. It's amazing. And over time, you know, we're not yet perfect. It's not going to happen until you're in his presence directly. But over time, we are made more and more holy, set apart, consecrated, sanctified until we die or until he returns, whichever happens first. So this is the logical order of salvation. And primarily, it deals with, you know, all of these different aspects are dealing with something that's happened for Christians in the past. Election, that happened in the past. And the work of Christ, and then we're effectually called. That, that already happened for Christians, Right? We were regenerated in the past. We, we received uh, saving faith in the past. We repented unto life in the past. We were justified in the past. We were adopted in the past. But sanctification deals with those who have been chosen in Christ, those who have been effectually called, those who have been given faith, who have been regenerated, who, have, who died to their sin, 
who, are being, uh, who have been justified and who have been adopted. It deals with the rest of those people's lives. So it's the entirety of the Christian life that we're now talking about. See, what we're talking about before was something that happened way in the past, and then something that happened instantaneously like that, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And now we're talking about the whole Christian life, the whole thing. So it's an important topic. John Owen said, it is the removal of the pollution of sin. The removal of the pollution of sin. And guess how long that takes? Forever. It takes your entire life. The process is never made perfect. Doesn't matter what Arminians tell you. Doesn't matter what Wesleyans tell you. Doesn't matter what anyone tells you. Doesn't matter what Roman Catholics will say. We'll never be perfectly holy in this life. For we're still indwelling sin. But over our lifetime, we are made more and more holy. By the power of the Holy Spirit by the righteousness of Christ, by his blood, by his resurrection. Okay, so this is where we are in the order of salvation. For the Christian, sanctification is in the here and now. It is living out the Christian life. It's progressive. You'll hear the term progressive sanctification. That means sanctification for our whole entire lives. All right, so what exactly is it? Let's get a nice definition, okay? We've already been talking about it in all these different ways, but I want a nice precise definition. How about you? Yes? All right. So our second consideration tonight, we will define our terms. And the terms tonight, there are three. Sanctification, mortification, and vivification. Sanctification, mortification, and vivification. So let's begin with sanctification. Now, normally, we would just use the shorter catechism, right? Sanctification is the work of God's free grace whereby we are renewed in the image of God and are enabled more and more to die into sin and live unto righteousness. But I figure if you're the type of person who's going to come to the evening service, you don't want the kid's catechism. You want the big kid catechism, right? That's the type of person who comes to the evening service. You want the larger catechism. You don't even want the confession of faith. You want to get beyond You want the larger. So that's what we're going to look at, the big kid catechism. And besides, we're all Presbyterian and raised in the Presbyterian church, right? We we remember the catechism from number five. We don't need that stuff. We need the larger catechism. So here's number 75 from the larger catechism. This is really easy. I want you guys to remember this, okay? There'll be a quiz next week. Here it is. Sanctification is a work of God's free grace whereby they whom God hath before the foundation of the world chosen to be holy are in time, through the powerful operation of his Spirit, applying the death and resurrection of Christ unto them. Wow, that's amazing. Stop and think about that for a sec. The powerful operation of the Spirit applies the death and resurrection of Christ to us. That's amazing. And by this, we are renewed in the whole man, the whole person, not just our arm, not just our mind, the whole person, after the image of God, having the seeds of repentance unto life and all other saving graces put into our hearts and those graces so stirred up, increased and strengthened as that they more and more die unto sin and rise unto newness of life. Now, I know that's a big definition. I get it. But you know how you learn the larger catechism? You know how you, you learn it? Same way you eat an elephant. Bite by bite, right? One bite at a time. So let's just take one bite at a time and take a look at this amazing, amazing definition. First, Sanctification is a work of God's free grace. So perhaps you recall justification, adoption. Uh, these, are not, uh, these are not works. They're acts. Okay? An act is a one-time thing. Justification is a one-time declarative act. Uh, adoption, a one-time legal act with 
lifelong ramifications, of course, but it's a one-time thing. Whereas on the other hand, sanctification is a work. That means it's a process. Okay? So you'll never be perfect, totally perfect. This is a lifelong process. It is a work of God's free grace. And, and remember, it's by God's free grace. So it's not by your hard work. Salvation is of the Lord. Continuing the definition, whereby, in this work of God's free grace, they whom God hath before the foundation of the world chosen to be holy. Now that's important because it's the thing that we've been continually reminded of in this sermon series. Uh, redemption accomplished and redemption applied only concerns a certain type of person. The elect. Redemption accomplished and redemption applied for the elect. And we know that these things are going to happen to us and have happened to us and will continue to happen to us because it's founded in election. Okay? It's founded in election, and that's powerful. It goes all the way back to before time. That's how sure we can be about these doctrines. It's not going anywhere. If you're justified... It's because you were chosen in Christ before time to be justified. You're being sanctified because you were chosen in Christ to be his holy people from before time. And in time, we have the powerful operation of the Spirit. I love that. The powerful operation of the Spirit applying the death and resurrection of Christ to us. It's almost like, by seeing this language here, it's almost like they wanted us to do a sermon series called application of redemption because that's exactly what they're talking about the spirit applies the death and resurrection of christ to us i would even add his righteousness i don't want to add to the confession on this we talked to the presbytery we talked to general assembly but i i would throw it in there that it's his righteousness as well being applied to us by the spirit hopefully that sounds familiar You're probably tired of hearing me say that if you right i mean i've been saying it every week You're tired of hearing it and by this, the divine's right, we are renewed in the whole man. That means the whole person, the whole body, mind, soul, our whole being is being renewed. Purification of the entirety of our person. After what? After the image of God. Remember, we were created in the image of God, but after the fall, we're now going through, for the elect, are going through this renovation process whereby that image is being restored, being cleaned, and we are being sanctified after his image. Having the seeds of repentance unto life and all other saving grace put into our hearts. In other words, we repent, we believe, and we have assurance that we are God's. We have joy in the Holy Ghost, and we have confidence because we are in Christ Jesus. And this only increases with time throughout our entire life. And we have these things stirred up in our hearts and increased and strengthened, enabling us to die unto sin and live unto righteousness. Okay, that's really important. Dying to sin, living unto righteousness. Okay? So this is our definition of sanctification. It's easy to remember, as I said, quiz is next week. Okay? But the last part, dying to sin, living unto righteousness. That brings us to our final two terms here, mortification and vivification. Hopefully those sound a little bit familiar, right? If you know any Spanish or any Latin at all, those words should sound kind of familiar. Mortification. What do you think that is? Think mortician, right? What does a mortician deal with? Living bodies? No, dead bodies. And vivification. You know, if you ask someone in Spanish, vivo, like where do you live? Where do you, vivo means where do you live? And they say, you know, vivo, bad acts, right? Lots of Spanish people say that. It means life. Where do I live? So you've got these two words, mortification, vivification. Mortification is dying to sin, putting your sin to death, crucifying the flesh, as Owen famously said, be killing your sin or it will be killing you. Putting our sin to death is mortification. This is what we do every Lord's Day in our worship service when we stop in the morning and we confess our sins. We are dying to our sins. We're hating our sins. And so what do you think vivification is? Living. Walking in newness of life. New obedience. Living 
unto righteousness. So this is what sanctification consists of, mortification and vivification. Mortification, dying to sin, crucifying the desires of the flesh. Vivification, walking in newness of life. In other words, holy living, being God's holy people, zealous for good works. Okay, so we've located sanctification in the order of salvation. And now we've defined our term, sanctification, and then those two uh, terms that flow out of that doctrine, which are mortification, dying, vivification, living. And so now we turn to our final consideration tonight, which is we're going to go back, bite through, or bite by bite, piece by piece, take it apart, and we're going to see if indeed it is biblical. Because if it's not biblical, we could just throw it out. We don't need it. And you can just never trust the divines, right? Always tricky. And don't trust me, right? Take the Holy Scriptures' word for it. Be a Berean. Check the Holy Scriptures. So is the doctrine of sanctification biblical, or did they make it up for fun? Sanctification is a work of God's free grace, whereby they whom God hath before the foundation of the world chosen to be holy. Okay, so let's stop there. Who does sanctification apply to? It applies to the elect, right? Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and following. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. What did he do? He chose us. When did he do it? Before the foundation of the world. Why? To be holy. Holy. That's, by the way, where the term sanctification comes from. Holy in Latin, I believe, is sanctus, which is where you get the term sanctification. Okay? Remember, most of our theological terms either come from Latin or Greek, because for 1,700 years, that's what theology was done in. But then something happened in the modern age. Something different. So chosen in Christ before time. Why? To be holy, to be sanctified, for the purpose of living holy lives as God's holy people. Sanctification. So far, so good. Sounds biblical. Definition continues. The elect are in time, through the powerful operation of his Holy Spirit, have the death and resurrection of Christ applied unto them. Part of our regeneration, right, is having the Holy Spirit placed within us. As Ezekiel says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, says the Lord. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. That is the powerful operation of the Holy Spirit enabling us to live holy lives. Only by the Spirit that we are able to do this. And where is it, in particular, that the Spirit applies the work of Jesus Christ to us? Where do you think it is? You think it's at the ball field? You think it's at the hockey rink? You think it's at the snow thing? The hunting box you sit in? Where do you think that happens? Maybe if you're reading the Bible in the hunting blind, right? It happens through the preaching of the word, through the administration of the sacraments, and through prayer. That's why we have a high view of liturgy. That's why we have a high view of the worship service. So it's by the virtue of the death and resurrection of Christ that we are made holy, that we are sanctified, and he applies this work to us through the word, through the sacraments, and by prayer. So... By virtue of our union with Christ, we are receiving his benefits as the Spirit works through extraordinary means. No? I see. No? Ordinary means, right? Ordinary means. As Paul said in our epistle reading, Romans 6, 3 and following, Do you not know that those of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? In other words, we've been united to Christ in his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism. So he's referring now 
to, is he referring to the baptism by water or by the Holy Spirit? The answer is yes. Yes. We've been buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So there you see the dying and the living right there. And it's connected to the sacrament of baptism. Dying and living. United to Christ's death and united to his resurrection. That we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. It's like Paul says, we are crucified with him on the cross. Our sins are nailed to it. That's awesome. That's for our justification and our sanctification. Beautiful. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ. So we're talking about his resurrection. Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. This is how we're sanctified. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died. Because Christ died. And you're united to him. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. And finally, Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and would share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so there's an important thing that we need to remember. It's also through suffering that we are sanctified. Uh, No one likes that part, right? I don't like that part. But Peter says that. Peter talks about the purification process of the elect. It's going through difficult times in our lives that God is putting us through a purification process. But guess what? We're united to Christ in his sufferings. And so we're being sanctified by his sufferings. Powerful operation of the Spirit applying the death and resurrection of Jesus to us through word, sacrament, prayer, and trials and tribulations. Continuing in our definition, we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God. Remember, we were created in the image of God. We fell, and that image was broken, muddied, and so God is renewing it. He's renovating that image in us. As Paul says in Ephesians 4.23 and following, he exhorts Christians to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life. So this is indwelling sin. We're no longer in Adam, and yet we still have remaining sin because of Adam, because of the fall. So he's saying, put that off. And be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self created after the likeness of God. Likeness means image. Created after the image of God in true righteousness and holiness. This is sanctification. Being conformed to the image of Christ in true righteousness and holiness. And this beautiful benediction which we'll hear later this evening. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Awesome. The divines continue. Having the seeds of repentance unto life and all other saving graces put into our hearts and those graces so stirred up, increased and strengthened. And so that means over time, our understanding that we are justified. And the joy in the Holy Spirit and the assurance that we have because of that increases. And therefore, sanctification increases because we understand what God has done for us. Why do we say the same things week in and week out? So we would better understand them and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus and be sanctified. Paul says in Ephesians 3.16, According to the riches of God's glory, that he would grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being. Being strengthened. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ. Growing in our knowledge of the love of Jesus, which surpasses all knowledge, that we would be filled with all the fullness of God. This is a process and this happens over time. And we're strengthened. We grow in our assurance. We grow in our confidence in our union with Christ. It's amazing. And this happens over time. But guess what it's called? Sanctification. Continuing in our definition. 
as that they more and more die unto sin and rise unto newness of life. And so this is what Paul continued to talk about all through Romans chapter 6. Die to your sin, live unto Christ. Live resurrection lives, be dead to your sins, and walk in Christ. Live in Him. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling that you've received in Christ Jesus. That dichotomy of dying and living, dying and living, dying and living. That's what sanctification is. Mortification, vivification. Being in Christ leads to sanctification, which ends in eternal life. But being out of Christ leads to death. This is sanctification. So what do you think? Do you think the doctrine of sanctification is biblical? At least the one presented here is, right? I think it's biblical. And for us, there's no way around it. There's no way as Christians that we can't be sanctified. We have to be sanctified. As Hebrews 12, 14 says, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And beloved, that's what we're all about here. This is what we do. This is why we have two worship services for our sanctification. This is why if you look at our liturgy, so many readings. I've, heard, I've actually heard complaints. Can you believe that? Complain. Too much Bible. You really need to be sanctified. Too long a sermon. Well, it's because you need it. right? Why do we have the sacraments so often? Because you really need it. This is how God sanctifies his people. We don't shy away from the fact that life isn't always perfect and easy because this is part of the process of our sanctification. We preach on difficult texts. We talk about over the last few weeks, is is the Christian life easy? Maybe over the last several months, is the sojourn, the pilgrimage of the Christian life easy? No. Where does it say it's easy? Nowhere. And that's why we focus on it, to be sanctified, because we take the doctrine of sanctification very seriously. So as John Murray said, sanctification is the elimination of all sin and completely being conformed to the image of God's own Son to be holy as the Lord is holy. And I want to encourage you this evening to remember that, to remember that it's putting to death sin and walking in newness of life, living in Christ Jesus. As Alexander Archibald Hodge said, Sanctification involves the gradual destruction, mortification of the old body of sin and the quickening and strengthening. That means, quickening means living. Of all the graces of the new man and the inward purification of the heart, mind, and actions. Beloved, be sanctified. Die to your sin and be conformed to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. As Abraham Kuyper called sanctification, one of the greatest gifts bestowed upon believers within the covenant of grace. Amen. And thanks be to God for the wonderful doctrine of sanctification by the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus.